All right, we are going to go ahead and get started here. Um, so welcome, everybody, uh, concurrent enrollment coordinators and uh, secretaries. Uh, Becky just went ahead and uploaded a copy of the uh, the agenda for this meeting. And uh, But maybe before we do, uh, I just wanted to let you all know that, uh, so what we decided, uh, Becky and I were talking, and we thought, um, we have this monthly meeting with our faculty liaisons. We started another one with our college experience liaisons, and those have gone really well. And so we thought, well, maybe we ought to start having a monthly meeting with the coordinators and uh, and secretaries just so that we can go over any important updates and then also so that we can hear any questions that you might have, concerns, and uh, and then hopefully address those. So we've got a few items on the agenda that we're going to go over today, and then after that, we'll just open it to any questions or thoughts or concerns or feedback that you might have uh, for us. And we are recording this meeting, so those who can't attend uh, will, will be able to, uh, to, to watch this later. Is there anything you want to say, Becky? There's not really. Um, sorry, I'm going to let Brandon take most of this just because um, I, I have a very red face today. <laughs> You guys don't want to look at me today. <laughs> it's all that sun in San Antonio, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. That's 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 the better story. <laughs> all right, awesome. Well, we will go ahead and dive in. Um, you can see from the agenda, we've got several items. I'll go over really quickly what we're going to talk about, and then we'll just dive in. And uh, the first one is the teacher application deadline. We're going to talk about um, the importance of that here in a second, talk about student registration deadlines, AP scores, UCI math scores, on-campus uh, course offerings and fees, small balance holds, RFRs, the new placement test, and class caps. So those are the topics we'll go over. And then, like I said, after that, we'll give you time to ask any questions that you might have. So if you want to, the, uh, the first one on the teacher applications, um, we just wanted to, so in the in the past couple of years, we've had a lot of crazy things that have happened. We had COVID, <clears throat> and then we had some issues with some of our, our technology systems. And because of that, we, we ended up extending our deadlines, adjusting things, and that because of those exceptional circumstances. And we just wanted to, um, to, to remind you that, that those were for special exceptions only, and that in the future, the deadlines are deadlines. So when it comes to teacher application deadlines, um, we, we will be holding to those deadlines, especially for ongoing applications. And uh, one of the things that Becky pointed out is this year, we have had a lot of ongoing applications that have been submitted to us way after even the the, um, the deadline for uh, for uh, new applications, the ultimate, like the the exception exception deadline, sort of thing. So those ongoing applications need to be submitted um, by the deadline, which is March thirty first. And if there are any real exceptional reasons for ongoing applications after that, um, July I think it's July thirty first is the absolute cutoff. Um, for for those applications, we had a lot of issues when when an ongoing application doesn't get submitted until uh, until classes have already started. There's all sorts of issues that have arisen um, in terms of students being registered, getting access to Canvas, um, uh, inclusive access materials, and all kinds of other things. So we will be sending out reminders to. Um, to all of you. And also this year, we'll be sending out in, uh, reminders to instructors. Now, some of you, uh, you, you prefer that the coordinator is the one who submit the applications, but there are also a large number of you that rely on the instructors to submit applications. So when we send out that reminder uh, for the ongoing applications, we will uh, we will uh, make a note to instructors to be sure to consult with the coordinator um, when they're submitting those, just in case you as the coordinator prefer to be the one submitting those. Um, but we do need to make sure those ongoing applications come in. In terms of new applications, the deadline, again, is March 31st, but we understand that there are there are 
quite a few instances where an instructor leaves after that date or retires and you don't find out until the summer. We're still more than happy to work with you on those up to July 31st. Um, so if you have an instructor that leaves, all you have to do is reach out to me and say, hey, we just had this emergency situation. The instructor left and we're trying to find a replacement. And then I will connect, uh, I will connect all of the key stakeholders together, the academic department, the principal, uh, the coordinator, so that we can make sure that everybody's in the loop on what's going on and that we can get that instructor trained as soon as they're hired so that they're ready to go. Um, so a question came up from Kevin, when can we start submitting instructor applications? You can do those now. We usually open the application uh, portal uh, after after the semester, the fall semester registration has ended, then shortly after that, we open the, the portal. So you should be able to open those now or submit those now for 2020, uh, 2024. But just be aware that moving forward, if an application, we don't get those ongoing applications submitted by the deadline, then we will not be scheduling classes for those instructors. So just so we don't have all the issues that we've had this, this semester. The next one, uh, Becky, do you want to add anything there? Um, I just want to add, I mean, the ongoing applications are not a huge deal after the March 31st, but it, it does create an issue um, with, you know, just making sure, you know, reminding everybody that it's, it needs to be done. And, and typically after the deadline, you guys aren't really thinking about it and the teachers aren't thinking about it. Um, my biggest issue was... Um, the ongoing applications, I had some that were requesting classes three or four weeks after classes started, and it created huge issues for students being able to get registered for those classes. Um, so I absolutely will not um, add or subtract any, well, I won't add any classes, any sections after the first day of classes, because it's it get it created so many problems with students being able to register for those classes. So just make sure that you are checking to make sure that you have all the classes that you need. Um, you know, removing classes and it is I can do that anytime, but adding classes really can create issues that we don't really think about until we do it. So Okay, great. Um, I'll also add to that really, I mean, we do need to shoot for the March 31st deadline. Um, it's no big deal in terms of uh, uh, Becky getting things scheduled between March 31st and July 31st, but where it creates issues, if the ongoing application isn't submitted, then the academic departments have no idea whether that instructor is teaching. So they miss out on professional development. They miss out on any sort of training. Uh, that's going on because we we have we have no idea that they're teaching. So the ongoing application really is to is to just let us know who is planning on teaching next year. And mm -hmm. but we understand also that you may submit an application um, because you you think they're going to teach, but then fall rolls around or you do your final scheduling during the summer, finalize your boards, and they don't end up teaching. That's okay. Um, just make sure you get those applications in, the ongoing applications as soon as possible, and if possible, the new applications as well by March 31st. So that way we know who is intending on teaching. We can make sure they get all the training that they need and that they're ready to rock and roll by, uh, by fall semester or spring semester. Okay, um, next item on the agenda was the, uh, let's see, student registration deadlines. Um, so as I had mentioned, we have had uh, we, we've had some exceptional things that have happened in the past with COVID and other technology systems. But when we don't have technol technological issues or a pandemic, those deadlines are hard deadlines. So if students don't get registered by those deadlines, then then they're out of luck and they need to be removed from the class. Uh, or, or if it's a mixed class, they can stay in the class. They just need to be. They just need to understand that they, they're not going to be getting college credit for the class. Um, and Becky, is there anything you wanted to say on that one? That's all I can think of. On um, we're going to be a lot more strict about this um, from now on. I've gotten a lot of backlash from different departments for different reasons with late registrations. Um, it creates issues both in um, our bursar's office and in. Um, 
the, the inclusive textbooks, um, there's like an opt out period that that they miss that opt out period. Um, there, there's all kinds of issues that it creates when we let them register late. Um, so I'm getting a lot of backlash and I'm going to have to be a little more strict on that. Yeah, that's a good point. It does create a lot of issues with students if they're not registered as, as early and as soon as possible. So, yeah. Okay, uh, next item is, let's see, AP scores. So we had some issues this year, we've had some issues in the past where uh, students will complete the AP exam, they <clears throat> request their scores be sent to Salt Lake Community College, or maybe they don't and they do it later and they try to expedite it, but those scores never arrive at Salt Lake Community College. Um, so, this year we had uh, we had quite a few that had requested it and it had been it was months since they had requested it and they never arrived and so we revisited uh, this issue with some of the key stakeholders which are the registrar's office the english department the incoming transcripts office and several others to try to figure out how we how we handle this or can we handle it and what we landed on is that if a student has is is trying to use their AP scores as a prerequisite for English 1010, and those haven't arrived by the registration deadline, then during that one week cleanup period uh, after the registration deadline, they can submit an appeal to the English department. And, and then it's in the hands of the English department to decide if they are gonna grant that appeal based on the evidence that the student has submitted. Uh, they haven't given us any guidance on what documentation is required, but I mean, what is as close as you can get to official documentation is probably going to be helpful. So if you have a copy on the high school transcript, the AC, the uh, AP scores, that would be great. If you have um, a readout from College Board, that would be great. And one thing that I do need to also uh, uh, let you know is that the high schools are not submitting this uh, request to the English department. The student has to submit it and they have to do it through their Bruin Mail email account. So they would email Jerry Harwell, who's the current associate dean, and, uh, and then it would be in her court. Now, if a student submits that request and the override isn't granted during that one week cleanup period, but they're still mulling on it and time goes by, as long as they get the email sent and they can show that they sent an email, to the English department chair during that one week cleanup period, then we will continue to work with them until that is granted. And if it goes through, if for some reason it goes, they, they submit the the appeal uh, to be to be added despite us not, not having the scores, then um, then and it's it's you know several weeks go by for them to process that appeal and it's not granted, then I. Just reach out to me. What we could potentially do is let the students stay in the class because it would have been four or five, six weeks into the semester now, but not they would not be getting uh, college credit. So that's the new process, and that mirrors the process for students on our campus. So if their scores are not there and they want an override, a prerequisite override to be able to register in English 2010, then they would have to send that email through their Bruin Mail account to the English department. And, uh, and then once that's granted, it goes to the registrar's office, the registrar's office notifies Becky, and then Becky will keep you posted on whether or not that was granted or whether it was, uh, whether it was denied. So that's the, that's the process for any AP scores that don't arrive at Salt Lake Community Co College by the registration deadline. Up to the registration deadline, then they need to make every attempt possible to register themselves. So is there anything else you want to say, Becky, on that one? Um, I was just going to say, so you won't send those appeals until after the registration deadline, but it has to be sent during that one week cleanup period. So I give you guys that one week to send in late registrations. That's it, when it would need to be emailed to the English department. Awesome. And there are a couple of questions that came up. Um, 
Yay. One of them, let's see, the first one, when is the, the one week time frame again? So it is when the registration deadline hits. So whatever the registration deadline is, it's posted on our on our calendar. Um, I'll pull it up really quick and we can take a look. And so for fall semester, the registration deadline was September 8th. So it would be September 9th. So one week after September 8th. So from the 9th to the like the 15th or something like that. The 15th, yeah. Is that that one week period? So that's the one week time frame. Uh, Anne asked if there is a specific email for the English department. Uh, right now, it would be Jerry Harwell. And uh, I mean, that could change by spring. <clears throat> Never know. So probably the best thing to do would be for Becky to uh, probably send that information out just so you have the most up to date information. Because if I give I you that email put, now, I put Jerry's email there, but you know, okay. I'll definitely let you guys know if that changes. Okay, great. Uh, the next question was from Emily. It says, is there an issue with the system of SLCC getting the scores or is it simply College Board taking too long to process? We've been working with students since September to get scores sent and are still not seeing them in my CE. So the issue is with College Board sending those. It is, this boggles my mind, uh, but it, it is a, it's a, it's a paper process. They send a, a print off of the scores in a sealed envelope through snail mail. So there are all kinds of issues that could happen either at College Board or between us receiving them. They could end up sent here to the wrong office. I mean, there's so many issues with that paper system. But I mean, the folks who are over here at the college have looked into it. They've gone around and tried to check to see if they can find them. They can't find them anywhere. But as soon as they do get those in interim, uh, they have been letting Becky know. So I think the issue is somewhere on College Board's side, it's, it's getting lost in the shuffle. I will say that um, our our AP specialist, the person that that's processing all these AP scores now, did reach out to a to College Board, and she has noticed like in the last few days we've been getting a lot more of them. So um, yeah, so we I, I think that they're starting to get them to us, or people are just asking to have them resent. I don't know, but we have been getting a lot more of them in the last like week and a half. Good. One thing too that I'll mention is that when a student, so if it's, the scores don't arrive to us and the student, if they reach out to uh, the English department right now and, and request a an ex, uh, prerequisite exception and that's granted, all it does is waives the prerequisite for that student based on the evidence they provide because because uh, they, they have enough evidence or information that they've got qualifying scores. So they override the prerequisite, the student registers, but if they register for the class, they take, they complete the class, they go to graduate and those AP scores never arrived with us, then they will not be graduating until those scores get here. So the student would have to go work with college board and continue to try to get those submitted, or they would have to take English 1010 or another English class in order to meet graduation requirements. So, I mean, the best option that we recommend is that students do English 10, 10, 20, 10, and then they'll have no issues whatsoever. But um, that's, again, it's up to you and it's up to the student what they do. Uh, let's see, there's another comment. I have a student that's in English 2010 that's dropping the class. He didn't follow through uh, with the AP exception and has not been registered for the class. I have two questions. Uh, number one, we don't need to do a withdrawal because he was never registered. Um, that would be correct. Yep, no, no withdrawal needed since we didn't, we didn't even know that student existed, uh, since he never registered. And number two, he won't get a W from SLCC, but his grade will be um, what it is on the high school side, right? Um, so yes, he will get a grade on the high school transcript, but he will have nothing on his college transcript. We will have no idea that he ever even took the class. Let's see, Matt asks, AP scores are now being added to the credit for prior learning department. I've called and left several messages with questions and have never gotten a call back. Um, I think, Becky, you can probably speak to this. I think they're pretty overloaded right now. They are. Um, really, it's it's one person that's running everything right now. I think they're kind of working on that, but she's, she's doing the best that she can. Um, she does tend to respond to me. So if you want to send the question to me, I'll try to reach out to her. Okay, great. 
Uh, next one, Kim, uh, what is the next step after a student send their AP score report? Transcript evaluation form, room mail verification. Um, so then the next, so if a student submits their report, they just attempt to register. And if they can't register by the deadline, then it's at that point that they reach out to the English department. And uh, it's, I think it's just handled via email right now. There's, I don't know of any forms or anything like that. Becky, do you want to add anything to that one? Um, no, that's it. Um, they they just, yeah, once they get that, they decide whether or not they're going to approve it. And then they send that information to me and I get it processed. Or, And then I will let you guys know. I, I'll send you a quick email saying, hey, this, this one was approved and student's been registered. Okay. And then Matt added that he noticed that some of his students have gotten an email from Credit for Prior Learning saying that they've received their scores, asking them to let them know if they want to add the credit to their SLCC transcript. Um, you may want to have your students check their Bruin mail. Yes, that is correct. They, they, my understanding is they don't actually award that credit until the student confirms uh, that what they want credit for. So the student would get an email. Um, I'm not sure. I think it may go to their Bruin mail. It may also. So what happens is sometimes with our regular students, they will they'll take like several AP classes, but they don't necessarily want the, all of those showing up on their transcripts. And so their new process is to send an email to their Bruin mail saying, "Hey, do you want credit for this?" Um, but we do have. Her name is Andrea. Um, Andrea and I do have an understanding. If you guys send me a list of all the students in your class, um, she will go through and check and see if she has AP scores for any of them. Um, and she'll actually use that list and just automatically process them. So if, if she does get them. So um, if you want to send me a list of your students and that's going into your English 2010 classes, she'll watch for them and automatically process them. Yeah. And then there is one other question. Is that email a redundancy of the student completing the transcript evaluation request? Um, <clears throat> when you say email, which email are you referring to, Emily? I'm talking the one that's going to their Bruin mail, asking them if they want the credit on their transcript. I just it just seems like if the student's doing the transcript evaluation request, it made sense that it would just that they would be putting the credit onto their transcript. But I can see the point of if they send every AP score the kid's ever taken, then there's the clarification on which pieces of that. So I yeah. guess. You and know. <laughs> they don't need to do the transcript evaluation request anymore. So don't worry about oh. having them do that. Okay. So the they time they would need to do that course. is if they're sending transcripts from another institution. Oh, perfect. Okay. So. Thank you. Okay, well, let's uh, let's move on to the next item. We've got AP scores now, Yushi math scores. <clears throat> so on the, um, uh, for, for well, actually, so let me figure out how to, how to phrase this. So the Yushi math score is the secondary math score. Um, it's basically the C or better in secondary math one, two, or three. And that is a requirement for uh, math 1050, they have to have the C or better in secondary math one, two, and three and qualifying scores. For the other classes, for math uh, 1030, 1040, 1050, or 10, 1030 and 1040, they if they have a C or better in secondary math one, two, and three, they can use that as a prerequisite. Otherwise, they would have to have whatever qualifying scores are required there. Uh, what we've done up to now, we've had a... Um, <clears throat> Um, so up to now, what we've been doing is using the uh, USBE, the Utah State Board of Education has developed an API that sends us those secondary math scores. And then those are built into our courses so that uh, so that it's it's the systematic process that a student can't register if they don't have those scores. Um, and you don't have to worry about it. 
at all. But we've had some issues in the past where that secondary, those secondary math scores that are sent to us from Usheet are not accurate. So it's saying the student doesn't qualify when in fact they do, or they do qualify in, when in fact they don't. So a student would go would attempt to register and the system would yeah, block them because the score sent to us from USBE uh, indicated something that wasn't correct. Uh, when we talked to some of the other Yushi institutions, we found out that what they were doing is they weren't using the API at all. They had removed prerequisites from their courses and were leaving it up to the high schools to vet the students to ensure they had the secondary math uh, requirement in order to participate in math and to register for the course. So a student would never get a block or a hold whether the, they had the secondary math scores or not. And those institutions just trusted the high schools to make sure that the student had those scores. We are now following suit with all these other institutions. So the secondary math score will no longer be built into the prerequisites for the courses. That doesn't mean it's not a prerequisite. It just means that we don't have to worry about all these issues that have been created by bad data being sent to us and creating problems for students. So that said, I guess the, the, the prerequisite is still there, but now it would be your responsibility to make sure that the student, if they're going to place into math 1030 or 1040, purely on their secondary math scores, secondary math one, two, and three, then it would be your responsibility to make sure they had that. If they don't have it, then they need to meet the other prerequisite. Same with math 1050. So the only thing that our system is gonna be checking for is on math 1050, do they have qualifying placement scores? On math 1030 and 1040, there will no longer be a prerequisite um, systematically connected to that in our system. So if a student didn't have any qualifications and attempted to register, they would be able to register. So we are essentially trusting you all to ensure that a student has the secondary, the C or better in secondary math one, two, and three. The math department was, was a little uneasy about us removing that transcript, but we said, you can trust the high schools. They'll do a fantastic job. They'll ensure that students have that prerequisite and they won't let students register for those classes unless they have the C or better in secondary math um, or another qualifying prerequisite for 1030 and 1040, and that they have both of those requirements for 1050. So they said, okay, we'll trust you if you trust them, um, but we're gonna keep an eye on it. And if the math department finds that students are getting through without having that secondary math uh, score, the C or better in secondary math, then they will go back to using that automated uh, block uh, using the, the USBE API. So just know that moving forward that that will the secondary secondary math C or better, C or better in secondary math one, two, and three won't be connected to the courses anymore, but it is still a prerequisite that you would need to uh, vet students for. So let's see. Really Question. quick, Matt, Brandon, I was yeah, just go ahead. going to tell everybody what that means is that, yeah. like, if um, it basically what it means is that you guys will no longer have to send me in their transcripts to prove that they they registered. If a student is sly and registers anyway, um, and they didn't qualify, I mean, we expect there to be a little bit of that, like, I honestly, um, but I'm kind of hoping that, I mean, everybody kind of already monitors their classes and who's registered and who isn't and who should be and who shouldn't. So it's something you guys are all kind of doing anyway. Um, so like, you know, I, I, things happen. We know that one or two are going to get through. It's, it's not going to be a huge deal. Um, really what, what the math department is worried about is, is it raising our failure rate, um, and that's where it's going to become a problem is if, you know, we're letting students through and, you know, we, we, the failure rate in math classes starts, you know, going up um, and, you know, and then it comes back on us. Like, why are you letting these kids in? So that's where their concern was and, and, and not using that API. So, I mean, just do the best you can really. I mean, just try to watch it and make sure that you're letting them in. Um, I will say that if you do let somebody through and they throw a huge fit because they weren't ready for the class and they got in anyway, um, 
we're going to tell them it's, you know, they need to talk to you guys, just so you know, because we, you know, it's, it's up to you guys to kind of do that. Like I said, it, it was kind of a, it's kind of a balancing act. Like we were not, you know, there's that concern that you're going to let kids in that are not supposed to be in, but it's also, we're not creating barriers on the thousands of kids that we've been creating barriers on for the last few years with that API. So um, we kind of figured we would rather help these thousands of kids that we're creating barriers for than to worry about the, you know, 1% that's trying to get through when they shouldn't. Yeah, there are a couple that of questions. Makes sense to everybody. Is everybody okay with this? Let me uh, let me do this real quick. I'm just going to pull up. I'm going to share my screen and uh, just go through those. So, yeah, 1050 will still require the, the placement score or an ACT math score um, and the reading score if they're using ACT's um, English score if they're using the placement. So they will it will still require that that math and English or reading. Um, also be aware that um, they, they do not want to take the test scores off on the math classes that are on our campus. So if they are trying to get into a math class that's on our campus through the Concurrent on Campus program, um, and they are not using a test score, they either need to take the placement test and just place into it, or you're going to have to um, reach out to me to give them an override because um, I th they don't want to take those test scores off for, for our regular students, so they won't take them off. Or any on campus classes. So just to go over what the the requirements are. So you've all got access to this. It's under the coordinator resources and then there's the math pathways. So you can see for math 1030 it's a C or better in secondary math one, two, and three, or um, they have to have completed secondary math one, two, and three. S completing secondary math one, two, and three is the gateway to take any of the concurrent classes. If they haven't completed it, then they shouldn't be taking a, a math class by statute. Um, if they have completed it and they didn't get a C or better, then they can they can uh, have qualifying SLCC placement scores or ACT scores. And we're going to talk about these. This is actually changing here, which we'll talk about in just a second. So 1030 or 40, it's C or better or qualifying scores. 1040, C or better or qualifying scores. Uh, for the 1010 to 1050 route, um, it's the C or better uh, or SLCC placement scores. Is that right? No, it's, that's for 1010. For Math 1050, it is uh, the C or better and the SLCC placement score, I think, for both. So this will no longer be built into the system, the C or better. So now it would be your responsibility to just check to make sure that the students have that. And like Becky said, you don't have to do all these uh, submitting uh, documentation and that sort of thing. So those are the, the, nothing has changed here. The only thing that's changed is that the system is not checking for this. You would be checking for the C or better in secondary math. Okay, let's see. There are a couple of questions that came in. Uh, let's see. Can a student take math if they don't have qualifying secondary math scores, but do have a qualifying test score? Um, like I said, the, the requirements haven't changed. Everything is the same. Um, we tell Becky if a student is sly and registers anyway, if, if, anyway, if they don't didn't qualify. Nice. Let's see. Students still qualify for 1030, 1040 with appropriate test scores. Yes, they can, because it's the or, either they have C or better, or they have qualifying test scores for 1030 and 1040. Uh, Jennifer added, just to clarify, is there a math score requirement for math 1050 in addition to the C or better in math one, two, and three? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Um, math score, let's see, Kevin adds, it is a nice barrier so we can catch those that try to register without having those Yushi scores. 
Jennifer says, so all on on campus classes will be the same as they were. Um, Becky, this this applies as well to on campus, I believe. I yes, but they're really keeping the test scores on the on campus classes. So they, they are getting rid of the secondary math score. Um, so because we won't be even tracking that anymore. We won't even be using the API. We will not be pulling those scores in. Please, I watched them. Um, and so the on-campus classes will differ a little bit because it, it, if they it, even if it shows they qualify, they won't be able to register without test scores unless you reach out to me. So that the on-campus it, it does make it a little bit more strong, a little bit harder. But I mean, the the data that we've been getting from USVE has been horrible. I I will say it has been absolutely horrible to the point where I was like it was overriding my overrides, and so like these poor kids were not able to register for their math ten thirty classes because I would override it and use USVE data would come in and override what I just overrode like three times before they could get registered. And it was a ton of them and their data has just gotten worse and worse and worse. And so it's been a lot of work on your guys' end because you guys have to send in those support requests over and over and over for the same student. I have to go in and override it over, over, over for that same student. And that student gets frustrated. And I, I honestly, the reason that we pushed for this was because we had students that said, never mind, I don't even want to do it um, because they were so frustrated. You know, between the new application and these Yushi scores and whatever else was going on, they just got so frustrated. They were like, they were just like, never mind, I don't even want to do it. And that makes me sad. So I am trying to remove some of the barriers that these kids are having to face. Yeah, there was another question that came up. Does that mean that my CE will no longer show the Yushi squalifies like it does now? Um, I. Becky, I don't think we asked Ken to turn off the API. Yeah. We're just, we're just removing it from the prerequisites. Yeah, so we asked them. It, it will in the future, though, like because yeah. we, we will not be pulling that information in anymore. But for uh, now, it, it will pull in. That data will continue to pull in until no, we because be, API. remember you were, he was because we're not going to be using the program that pulls that information in the future. Yeah. So once we get rid of Axiom, it will no longer, it won't update that anymore. Okay. But for now, yes, it will, it will still show it. But in the, in the, in the future, if this works out and we can see that, that the students are being vetted well, that they're performing great in the class, we'll probably run a spot check just to make sure that students have those scores. And if everything is good and students are getting vetted and they do have, they do meet the qualifications, then uh, then eventually we would discontinue using that API and uh, and those would no longer flow into my CE. Okay, and then there was one last question. Okay, thanks Becky. So if they qualify but can't register, we just contact you. Correct. Okay. Awesome. Okay, let's go on to the next item here and that is on campus course offerings and fees. So we uh, concurrent enrollment students are not have not been charged fees and when we set up those uh, those classes and schedule them we remove any fees from the classes and what we found out is that that rolled over to our on campus classes but the issue we have with the on campus classes and fees is that in the high school we remove the fees because you cover the fees if there's a material fee or there's some other fee associated with it, uh, the class that the high school is covering that's, you, you know, um, like, like I said, facilities or equipment or whatever, then you take care of that. So there, it makes no sense for us to charge fees. And um, and I think by statute, we're not allowed to charge certain fees um, through concurrent enrollment. Although we did reach out to Yushi about our on-campus program because we have students taking classes, like maybe they take a photography class or a welding class, and the student are use the, the students are using materials in that class that are provided by the college, and so we are um, adding fees back to the concurrent sections on our campus. The high schools won't be affected, but those on our campus 
uh, will have fees. So students will be uh, charged the inclusive access. They'll be charged any material fees. If you have students that are going to be taking classes on campus and uh, and they qualify for fee waiver and you want to cover that, then you can work with our sponsored student accounts. And they basically you send them a list of the S numbers of the students that you want to sponsor. And then they would and tell them what you want to pay. Are you going to pay the tuition or or the just the fees or both? And then they would bill you instead of billing the student. So that's how you could handle uh, fees for students on uh, on fee waivers. Um, but that's that's the update for on campus. We did update our website for the on campus to add a com or a note there that says that those fees will be charged. I'll show you where that where that is here. So we go to the concurrent website. Let's go back. So there's the concurrent enrollment website. If you go down to concurrent on campus. And right here is a note that those fees will be instituted uh, on uh, spring semester 2024 is when those will be charged because um, we were losing a fair amount of money on using having these students use our materials, but nobody was paying for it. So, okay. Um, Becky, anything you want to add on uh, on campus course offerings and fees? Yes. So the other thing about the on-campus course offerings, a lot of you guys have already reached out to me and noticed that um, there may be a little bit, a few less classes being offered than there have been in the past. Um, the college uh, decided that they no longer, they made some changes to how classes are scheduled, which really affected um, how the scheduling office has to deal with things. And so they had to kind of scale down how many classes they were offering through concurrent enrollment, as well as make some other changes within the college because of these um, decisions that were made. Um, so yes, you will see, just so you're aware, there are gonna be less offerings than there has been in the past. Um, so what what is there is correct. What is on that schedule is correct. And also one of the things that we're doing, there there were quite a few classes and we're scaling it back because they they cross list a large number of classes and a, a significant percentage of those get no enrollments whatsoever. So we're trying to be a little more strategic in the in the uh, class sections that we offer so that we offer those that typically fill up with concurrent enrollment students. So we're looking at the data and trying to determine which ones actually have registrations on a regular basis. Um, there was a question about who do we contact if they uh, qualify for a fee waiver. Just reach out to Becky, and then she'll connect you with the sponsored student accounts. Okay, anything else on on campus course offerings and fees? Okay, so the next one is small balance holds. So the small balance hold, uh, which is a hold, which basically if the student owes less than $500, which is most concurrent enrollment students who owe tuition, uh, that in the past has impacted their ability to register and their ability to request their college transcript so they can transfer that to any other institution. Um, those small balance holds are gonna be removed from registration. So a student will be able to register even if they have a small balance hold. So that will no longer be a barrier for students. They will still need to pay that that balance if they want a copy of their college transcript, but it won't be it won't impact their ability to register anymore. So I believe that goes into effect for spring. Is that right, Becky? I believe so, yeah. Okay. So you will see a lot of when you run the hold report, if you use that in my CE or if you use the the admission the registration tracker, um, then you'll have a lot of students that that don't have, uh, you, you probably won't see that hold at all on any students anymore. So no longer a need to track students down. Um, Vicki asked, what about drops and withdrawals? Vicki, what, what, what exactly is your question with regards to the small balance hold? You wanna unmute yourself and clarify that? Um, in the In the past, students have not been allowed to withdraw 
until their small balance is paid. So I still have some students that um, withdrew at the beginning of second semester, but they've not paid. And so they haven't been able to withdraw. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. Do you know? So that yeah, I, all all of the registration once once they get rid of that. So right now I'm still following what they've told me to follow, but once they stop putting that small balance hold on there, um, it's not going to prevent me from being able to withdraw them. It's not going to prevent them from being able to register. Um, it won't prevent any kind of registration changes. But until that starts, it's gonna we're gonna follow the same rules that we always have. Super. Anything else? Okay, the next one is the right of first refusal process. Um, so just to kind of go over what right of first refusals are. So the by by statute, um, there are distinct service regions defined that each higher ed institution is in charge of. So Salt Lake Community College, um, our service region is the Salt Lake Valley, and uh, UVU would be the Utah Valley and Park City. Weavers got up north um, until like the Logan area. So we've got these distinct service regions, and we have a right to offer classes in those service regions. If uh, you as a high school want to offer a class that we don't offer, then you can request a right of first refusal to go offer that through UVU or Weber or, or Snow or wherever you want to go. Um, or if an instructor is denied or there's some reason why, why you don't want to offer it through us, then you can request a right of first refusal. And then if that's approved, then you go and work with uh, the other institution. So there's been a lot of confusion on what that process is. So I wanted to just kind of go over, it used to be that you had to fill out a form, a right of first refusal form, and then you would get multiple signatures to that and it would come to me and multiple signatures and someone would document that and it would end up somewhere. There's a lot of confusion there. So the concurrent enrollment directors uh, here in the state of Utah came together and we designed a different process uh, to make it a little more simple. Um, now, if you want to write a first refusal, so you're in the Salt Lake Community College service region, you want to offer something through uh, through another institution, then all you need to do is send an email to me and say, hey, there's this class that we'd like to offer through UVU. And um, I then have a conversation with folks here at the college to see if they want to offer the class, because if they decide, hey, yeah, we actually want to offer this class, then we may approve it for a one-year basis or a one-year time frame. And then after that, you would have to come back and work with us. But if the departments here decide, you know, we don't, we don't want to offer this class, sure, they can go with UVU. Then I add that information to a spreadsheet and send an email then to the director at the institution you want to work with and say, hey, we're good with this uh, this uh, right of first refusal. You're ha you're more than welcome to work with them. And then they'll reach out to their department, see if they want to entertain that and work with you to offer the class. If they approve it, then they just add that to the spreadsheet, the director does, and then you're good to go. So it's as simple as that. And just to show you some of the information that we that we need when you're requesting that right of first refusal, I'll share my screen again. So this is a copy of the right of first refusal spreadsheet. So once I get that email from you requesting uh, the right of first refusal, I go in and add the academic year, the course, the name of the course that you want to offer through the other institution, the district, the high school delivery mode, which you're in our service region. So I add that information there. I add the name of the institution you want to work with, the date you requested it, um, who, who the request came through, and then the date the decision was there. And then this is all signature information. We sign that off. And, uh, and then we add any notes here. And then once I send the email to the other concurrent enrollment director, they review it. If they approve it, they just mark it right here in the spreadsheet. And then that's it. 
And so whatever time frame we put here, so many of these are approved for five years, one year, three years, and then it calculates and it shows us when the uh, when the RFR is is expiring, expired, or it's, it's being processed. So this is what we use to track the RFRs. So there's no need anymore to use that that uh, paper form or the PDF form. This is now the process. It's just handled through a series of emails. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew how right of first refusals work, because like I said, there's been a lot of confusion about, about right of first refusals. Yeah, there's a question. Uh, can you send out an email with the required info for the RFR? Oh, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, maybe, or maybe we could put some information like on the coordinator website or something like if you're required, because if you're requesting an RFR, I do need to know like what course, what what the course uh, code is, like ART 1010, the course name, uh, intro to ART, and uh, and then the institution that you want to work with. Uh, those are the, those are really the only three points of information that, that we need. So it's really like pretty simple, um, but that's, that's basically that's basically it. Everything else I can gather internally. So, okay. Any other questions on RFR? Okay. The next one is the new placement test. So um, we all experience lots of frustrations with the Canvas placement test, which was a huge headache for many of us and the students. Um, that has now been retired and there is a new placement test that the college has launched. They actually launched it today. Um, they let me know they were launching it on Wednesday of last week. So we've been sort of frantically going through. We updated our website. Um, so let me share my screen again. I'll show you where those scores are posted. Okay. So on the course offerings page, which if we go to coordinators, and course offerings and instructor requirements. If you expand out any courses that in the past had the uh, the prerequisite um, or the test score, let's find uh, math. Math is probably good, math 1050. The SLCC placement now, actually that is not right. Let me refresh that. It's weird. Maybe I didn't publish it. Let's try English. Oh, oh no, it's English 1010 as a prerequisite. Oh, there we go. It's okay. the CEO. All right, we're good. So SLCC placement, I need to find out what happened on the math 1050, but the new score is listed here. Um, so it used to say, English 1010, the SLCC placement was English 1010. And now it's this new uh, Mobius is the name of the test. Uh, so it's a MOS 14 plus is what would qualify a student. So I'll figure out what was up with that 1050 and then get that updated. But I think most of the others should be uh, should be up to date. Let me show you how the students uh, complete or take the test. So a student will, uh, let's see, I know I've got it pulled up here. Shoot, send out, send back in. So a student will access the test via their, um, get in here, via their, uh, where's my phone? Their MySLCC account. So I'm gonna log in here so you can see. All right. All right, so a student will log into their MySLCC account and they'll see a, a little tab that says testing services. And then they'll just click start your test now. That'll open uh, Mobius and then they can just log in with their school account. So I haven't even, I haven't done this yet. Let's click on it and see what happens. So it looks like once they once they enter that, then they'll just go ahead and fill out this part and and uh, go from there. So I don't think I have access to it because I'm not an active student right now. But that's where they'll access it. They fill it out. My understanding is that the um, 
scores would be input into into our banner system within like 30 to 40 minutes or seconds. I can't remember. It's it's a really short amount of time. And then they should flow into my CE the next day. We are, have been working with our IT folks to uh, get a new export built so that it flows into my CE. Right now, they're not flowing into my CE, thanks to the fact that they didn't let us know until like the end of last week. So, but we are working, I've already submitted that with IT. Hopefully in the next uh, in the next few weeks, we will have that data flowing into my CE. So, um, Heidi, yes, the Canvas test is gone. Um, you'll still see the Canvas placement tests when they took them. So yeah, they, if they took previously took Canvas tests, you know, English tests are good forever. The um, math tests, I think, are only good for a year. So if it's still within that year, you'll, you know, you can use those test scores. They won't need to retake it using the OBS, but you'll still see those Canvas placement scores. Yeah, and then to Kevin's, uh, uh, will we see the Canvas? Oh, you, well, you answered that, Becky. Yep, you'll still see it in my CE. It'll still flow in, but they can't take the Canvas test anymore. So how can we get the information from the new test until you have a chance to build the report? Um, you, you really can't. I don't think there's any way to get that. Um, but hopefully, like I said, that that will be... And in the next couple of weeks, when all, when do you all need to see that information? Right now for Lisa, yeah, for the trimesters. Okay, so for those who are scheduling now, um, I will continue to put some pressure on IT so we can get that built in. But right now, I mean, we have no way. I, I'm assuming uh, since since the the notice came to us just last week, Becky, I don't even know if if you had a chance to like log into Banner to see if you can if you can see them. I I don't know because I don't know if anybody's taken it. Okay. But yeah, when are your students going to be taking the placement test? Like we said, right now they'll be able to see all the canvas the canvas scores. Those canvas scores are still going to work to place a student into uh, into their classes, and so will ACT scores and all the other scores that have worked in the past. So you have some so, that are now taking it. So yeah, if you if you've got them taking it now, you know, just put a list of students together, and I will check on test scores. Like I said it, it's fairly quick for me to check the scores. Um, I can always have Teresa also help me with those. So just send me an email with a list of your students that you need to check on test scores for um, until we can get that fixed. Yeah. And I will uh, send another nasty email to the testing services for pulling this on us again, because they did this last time with the Canvas scores. <laughs> Um, so everything from what they've told me about this test is it looks almost exactly the same. It's just a lot better than the Canvas one. Um, so yeah, all of the the requirements as far as retaking the test and what it looks like are going to be very, very similar. Okay, let's see. Do they do they need a math and English score for math ten fifty? Still, yes, yes. Nothing is changing. The only thing that's changing is the test mechanism and the and what the score will be. But there still will be an English score and a math score. Anything that had a, pre, a test score prerequisite before will still have a test score prerequisite. Yes, they can still cheat, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> it's all online. And as yeah. somebody asked earlier, if we would have a uh, a tutorial. Um, if there's not one already, I'll reach out to the testing center and see if there is one. If there's not one, I'll pay my son 20 bucks to take it for me. Mm. So you guys can see what it looks like. That'd be awesome. Okay, cool. Um, there's one last thing on the agenda and that is class caps. Becky, do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, so I just want to remind you guys to make sure you're you know, aware of the class caps. Uh, you guys are usually pretty good about it, but also make sure you're communicating that to your counselors and your admins. We had a lot of requests for uh, 
to raise the cap class caps because counselors just overrode whatever you guys were telling them or things um, the admin decided they wanted to make put more students in the class. Um, just make sure that your admin and your and your counselors are aware of those class caps and that you're not allowed to do that. I'm once in a while things happen and I don't mind reaching out to the departments, but they do tend to be kind of ornery about it. So I don't necessarily want to be calling them every day for class caps. Um, so just make sure you're aware of those and everybody um, involved is aware of them as well. Okay. Um, there was a question that came in from Heidi about the test. Um, is the wait time between test dates going to remain the same too? It'll be, uh, they should float once that once that is built into our MyCE system, they should flow in the next day. So the student will take the test one day, 30 to 40 minutes later, it'll be posted in Banner. And then yeah. that night it will uh, it will dump into MyCE. I think she's talking about retaking the test dates. And yes, oh, like okay. everything, all of those those dates and, and, and whatever is going to be the same. So yes. they can re still retake it once per semester, whatever the, the requirements were. And then you still has to be three weeks. I do know like when it gets close to the registration deadline, they kind of change it to like three days. Um, so just be aware that once in a while they do make some changes towards the end of the registration. Okay, and that's uh, another question from Vicki. What if the caps were changed midstream? We have students in the high school class before a cap changed, uh, what do I do with the extra students? Um, I I can't I can't imagine that tests that that uh, that the caps would change. They shouldn't change mid semester ever. I mean the the caps rarely change, and if they do, if a school if a an academic department tells us they're going to change the clap, caps. We give you uh, at least a, a year's notice, and the the caps can be found on the course offerings page. Um, just to answer Jennifer's question, so the course offerings and instructor qualifications, they uh, there should be a place there, I believe. Let's see. Yeah. So CSIS has always been pretty good about giving you know special exceptions to those caps um so they've always been 25 like the the class cap for csis 10 20 has always been 25 um but i know that they've given exceptions in the past um so just if if for any of the csis classes Ooh. just reach out to me All right. Well, we are at time. Sorry, we had a lot of stuff to go over and we didn't really give give you all a lot of time for questions, uh, other other questions. Um, I, I think Becky and I are happy to hang on the call here. I'm going to stop the recording, but uh, we're happy to hang on if anybody has any additional questions that they want to talk through. Becky, you all right with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks, everyone.